Hello students, welcome to Art Appreciation. So this is your instructor, Dustin Mothersbaugh. You can just call me Dustin in emails if you'd like. I, I really don't mind, I'm, I'm terrible with names. Or you just wanna call me Mr. M, doesn't matter to me. Let's go ahead and start talking about art appreciation. So I'm gonna try to do a few different types of PowerPoint videos or, or lectures so that you all can just have something that supplements uh, what you're reading. And this is one of my particular favorites because we're dealing with the aesthetical questions, uh, which is like the philosophy of beauty or art. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what art could be. Um, and then maybe on the next uh, lecture video next week, I'll kind of talk a little bit about, um, I'll kind of continue and refine some of this. So <clears throat> here we have the Latin Rs, and you're actually going to learn that, I mean, even in Greek, it's techni, and I'll kind of explain some of the stuff as we go, where this word comes from. But it comes from skill or craft. It's not just a noun, not just a thing, but it's an action, it's a verb that we predicate our things on here. So I'm going to come back to this slide, and I'm borrowing this from Thought Company. So it gives us three different aesthetical ideas of what art could be, mimesis, expression, and formalism. So, uh, okay, so you have art, which is an action or a thing. So what, what does, or who rather, does that action, and what is that thing that is created? Well, obviously you need an artist. A creation needs a creator. Some people think artists, like here we have Salvador Dali, are just um, cranks or crazy people, eccentrics. They think artists do these weird, banal things over and over and again, and people don't really understand the point of it, plus being eccentric, like Andy Warhol here. Or you, yes, have S-H-I-T, or crap, that is literally canned. Uh, this is postmodern. I mean, so we obviously, <laughs> we have a very broad, um, tolerant view of who an artist is and what an artwork is, right? Well, a lot of people, you know, think that art can be very different things. And I'm going to let you in on something. All of these things that I'm about to go over actually can be art. So here you have Andrew Wyeth's portrait on the left. This is very representational or very realistic, right? It's very objective, and um, that's what we call imitative or mimetic mimesis. And then over here on the right, you have something that's very emotive or expressive, like Edvard Munch's The Scream. So those can both be art. Um, and an artist doesn't just have to look at reality to make art, right? We always think of these eccentric people or strange people sitting in a room by themselves in a studio and ooh, they're making this stuff you know that people don't really have privy to as they make it well, this isn't really true art can be something that is every day right it can be something like these kids here uh, getting uh, what is it, ice cream or, or malts so it can be the banal, it can be historical. Here we have the mosaic of Alexander the Great. It can kind of uh, document before we had cameras uh, in a major event or a major historical figure. Uh, we have works here that also document the wealthy, the elite, but we also have works that show the plight of the poor or of folks that are struggling and then you you, you can actually express different um, societal issues or social strifes right 
uh, here, here's the obvious one. So if the if aesthetics traditionally is the philosophy of beauty, like on the left, yes, in this Da Vinci sketch we have beauty that is the beauty of the the human figure. But we also deal with ugliness, like he exaggerated this person's facial features on the right. So ugliness may not necessarily be a thing in itself, but it might be a privation, as we call it, or a limitation of what's beautiful. So it's a lesser degree of beauty. But these are all things that we discuss in aesthetics. Especially when you look at ancient cultures um, from all over the world, the East and the West, we deal with religious artifacts, right? Or icons, iconography. Uh, it was, you know, we visually can represent, it's not just uh, a pretty thing, a pretty painting or picture that goes on a wall, right? These are sacred figures, concepts, and it's an easier way to frame visually a way to communicate the divine and something that's beyond the temporal realm. We also have artists that make something very craftily, that's very eye-catching and appealing, that can be political. And obviously, I, I think we need to be careful when we discuss this subject. But um, there's a fine line between what is just a fine art and what is propaganda. Is it the intention? Is it the uh, reaction? Is it what happens? Like, how in causality do we deal with this? Um, so some people think art should be frilly and beautiful, like this painting on the left from the Rococo period, uh, but look at da Vinci's artwork on the right. It was a way, it can be scientific. It doesn't just have to be beautiful and or frilly or, or something that, that is what we see as base or shallow, but it can be something that's very deep and trying to understand the human condition, existence. So it has ontological implications, different aspects of being and trying to to push science and to push our understanding so it can be very intellectual as well it doesn't just have to be two-dimensional it can be two-dimensional like a painting or a drawing but it can be three-dimensional it can be something that uh, doesn't have to be realistic either this is one of henry moore's figures it looks like he sculpted this out of wood so it can be made of many ma different materials here we have ceramics which is mud right mud that is uh, molded, dried, fired. So another issue you deal with are two extremes, uh, is utility and um, ornateness. So on the left, you have just a simple jug, right? It's probably was used for carrying wine or water. But on the right, we actually have some gold-leafed uh, ceramic here and and it's something that is to attest more to beauty so it probably doesn't have a utilitarian function but it has a contemplative function and the Greeks would say that both of these are beautiful or, or rather virtuous virtuous uh, if we look at Aristotle's ethics so if a jug is carrying water correct like the one on the left it would be a virtuous jug because it fulfills its designed purpose or function. The same with the ornateness on the right. It's used to accent and give a sense of decadence to a particular place. And then again, going back to what is emotive, emotional, or expressive, you have Turner's painting up here at the top. But this is based in reality. We see the castle tops. It looks like a fire is happening here. And we can see the foreground. There's, there's some land in the horizontal. Um, brown, red, violet, uh, and greenish kind of colors at the bottom. So it is abstracted because it doesn't quite look like a photograph, correct? Uh, we have a sense of proportions here, but the colors are much more emotive. And, and even the style and the 
application of the paint from the brush is done in a, a more almost spiritually uh, in tuned way, uh, an inspired way. <clears throat> but it did push the boundaries in the Romantic period. Down below, you have Yves Tangai's painting, which looks like there's some strange, bizarre, weird, biomorphic shapes. These, um, th this painting I think is really interesting. It's a surrealist painting, comes out of that period. So Tangai here is obviously using information that he's gotten from examining reality. Look at the lighting on those forms and the shadows that are stretching behind. It looks like something that could sit in a space, right? Maybe it looks like it's on a weird planet and these things, these weird shapes, don't really look like anything real and they're stacked all wonky and stuff. So it's not realistic, uh, but it's done in a realistic way. So it's almost the inversion of the painting up on the top left by Turner. And then if you look at Kandinsky's painting of the, cir the colored circles on the right, I mean, we see that this is purely non representational. It is not derived from reality whatsoever. It's a formalist work. We're looking at the form and kind of like how the composition is made, right? And what the components of the composition make. And so it's these various circles and it's about color. It's about maybe the expressive kind of circle, circles. It's not really geometric. Some of his work is extremely sharp and geometric and this one's a little bit different. And so we often only sometimes think about fine art, like a nice pretty painting or sculpture that sits on a pedestal or on a wall. But art, again, can be an action. It can be about skill. So you can think of woodworking or metalworking, the industrial arts, things that go beyond the fine into the useful and practical that touches I'm sure everybody in this class's lives. And think about the process that that takes. Again, here is one of da Vinci's sketchbook drawings on the left. He came up with these ideas probably through observation of reality, through experiencing different types of mechanical structures. His mind worked it out, so he poured onto paper this great inspired work, and look what we've been able to achieve since the Wright brothers. We've been able to actually physically create something that pushes our technological understanding of the world. Here uh, is Frank Lloyd Wright, <clears throat> one of his most famous uh, pieces. Um, he was an architect. He was inspired by the simplicity of Japanese furniture and architecture. But yet there still is this elegance to his compositions. So here you again you have that process. I am creating something on paper, two-dimensional, but I'm thinking three-dimensionally. And then voila, it comes into reality. So it can be about the spaces in which we live. Whether it's something simple, even more simple than rights, correct? Or something as ornate that this um, large cathedral with its spiritual overtones and its celestial harmonies can allow. The, the form needs to um, fit the integrity of the intention. And then think again about just our lowbrow art, right? Things that we see in, in film, in music, <clears throat> probably more particular music videos. I mean, it's probably what we would look at in this class if I were to show you something. Uh, but here you have Sid Mead's up in the left top corner, Sid Mead's uh, art direction, um, his designs for the world in which Blade Runner was created. Or we have, uh, is a Carl from Pixar's Up? So character design, and think about that, you know, everything from cartoons to video games. Like, it does touch us in every way. The people that made these went to fine art academies, right? 
So they sat there and did, you know, what the old types like here we have a Norman Rockwell self-portrait with some humor. But but even though the process to cultivate an artist might be based in this very technique, we have different arts that are made for different purposes. So quickly going back to what these definitions of art, these are, of course are different aesthetical theories dealing with art, and there's a few others we're not, we're not going to deal with uh, anti-institutionalism, etc. But I'll, I'm just going to briefly touch on the basics. So here's uh, the two greatest philosophers of Western civilization. You have Plato, which is the student of Socrates, and then you have Plato's student, Aristotle. So <clears throat> these two great minds uh, thought very differently, but definitely were interested in the human experience for one, and they were obsessed with reason. So they were very um, about much about art being an imitation. It was mimetic, what we call mimesis. So in Plato's theory, you have his theory of forms. He said there's a heavenly realm that we participate in. This is his solution to the problem of universals. So when you, so so you have a tree, for instance, but there's let's say there's ten trees outside your window. They all are different looking. One's fat, one's thin, one's short, one's tall, one's bushy, one's bare. Um, but they all seem to have something in common. So he said, this is the world of particulars, a very specific sensory things, but there's this higher realm of thought, of forms or ideas in which there's tree-ness, which is the real thing. And really, the trees that we see in this world are just imitations of that abstract idea of tree-ness. They participate in it. I mean, that's as briefly as I can sum this up. And then Aristotle pushes that, so he's not a realist, as, as Plato's called, but he's a moderate realist. He says that, yes, there are these abstract universals, but they're housed within, like, maybe the DNA or the material thing itself, the structural makeup of that form, right? So there's something in the science of a tree that makes it a tree. I hope that kind of makes sense. So Plato really didn't like art because he said, you're just making a copy of a copy. So it's further, it's too far removed from what is real. But Aristotle said, no, let's deal with this world. It's what's real. But yeah, uh, so it is a copy, right? So I might draw a tree or a person and it's a copy of that thing. But Aristotle and his po poetics and rhetoric actually talks about how you can improve reality through art. So th these guys are very fundamental. Now we're moving up to some modern ideas. I'm going to try to just briefly go through this. I threw Kant in here because in, in some sense, he's the most, whether we like him or not, the most important modern philosopher. And both of these gentlemen, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Kant, lived at the same time in Enlightenment Europe and they were much more concerned with a subjective aspect of experience, but they, they, they very different temperaments and they looked at things in a different way, but there, there are some correlations here. And so Rousseau kind of inadvertently launched romanticism, the romantic movement, which is really about feelings or everything. I mean, that, that's how you could sum it up. You could change, Descartes cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, into I feel therefore I am. So think of it that way. So this is where we launch, you know, ex expressions and emotions. And so it's not really about the nat the bleak naturalism, but it's about that that inner that inner world of richness inside the psyche, the mind and what constitutes philosophy. And then we also have instrumentalist theory, which I, I briefly mentioned. Of course, Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. This is essentially where we get the idea of uh, instrumentalism, 
which is an artist is crafting a message, a form of communication, in this case, posters, right? So it's a visual form of communication to try to influence and incite the masses to movement through their thoughts and emotions, to, to push them to change something. I, I think this is dangerous. I think Marx is repugnant. Um, not that that's everything, but uh, feel free to ask me sometime about it. If you're interested, shoot me an email. I recommend everybody read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, and you will see why those Soviet gulags were uh, absolutely horrendous. So what's important here is it's about propaganda. It's using an artful skill to push something, in, in my best judgment, to destabilize a culture, to institute a new paradigm. And I'm going to leave it at that. So this is where things get a little bit hairy. We're, we're moving further up now into the uh, 20th century. Um, we're not just looking at logical positivism, which I, I omitted putting Bertrand Russell on here, but, but it moves up through all of analytical philosophy. I just put on Ludwig Wittgenstein here. Formalism. We have a Brancusi sculpture on the right. So it's very much about the formal qualities, how an artwork is constituted. That's through its shape, uh, textures, color, etc. The form. And then that further moves us into semiotics, which is the study of symbols or signs, what they signify and um, their use, right? Their usefulness, their utility. So <clears throat> here we have, I love the image on the right. You have the little Batman meme, like a comic book meme. And it talks about the icon as the picture, the text is the symbol, and the lines are the index. And we have other various things. Think of different languages, hieroglyphics, religious symbols, secret societies, <clears throat> symbols. Um, uh, transportation signs or uh, various um, other things. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know what I mean. So these are the basic fundamental aesthetical schools of thought. And they may help you um, and creating your own ideas. So I encourage you, this is just very supplemental, and it might help you. Feel free to use my video here if you want to quote any ideas from it. Um, I know many books. Uh, I have probably 150 books just on aesthetics. Um, and, and it is very fascinating. You can find a lot of this stuff for free online. Um, and, and I can always post a list if any of you are interested further in this. Um, but I hope this helps you. Generally, when we do a formal analysis, we're looking at it through a formalist lens. We're looking at the form. But some students might very well want to look more at the context or as Arthur Danto put it, the embodied meaning of an artwork rather than just how the message is communicated visually. So I hope this is helpful. I hope this has been interesting for you. And again, we're going to be looking a little bit later more at those formal qualities or principles and elements of design and so on and so forth. And we'll be looking at historical aspects of art and we'll be looking at production or the making of art so there's a lot of different things that i'm going to try to offer in this class uh and and i really hope you enjoy it feel free to email me anytime and thank you very much